So next, um, it really gives me a great pleasure to, um, you know, to introduce Tara. Um, and, and I told her I would keep it short, and she said, shorter, please. Um, but uh, Tara has had something of a sort of mighty fine year, I would argue, this year. Um, so Rockaway, the novel, uh, took off and has done uh, just a few small things, finalist for the Catherine Ann Porter Prize, finalist for the William Faulkner Creative Writing, William, who's William Faulkner? Um, no, um, no, the William Faulkner Creative Writing Prize, she was feature featured as one of the uh, best books of summer um, uh, uh, through Oprah, um, and other unbelievably fabulous reviews. Uh, of course, immediately this year, uh, Reeling Through Life, How I Learned to Live, Love, and Die at the Movies, uh, has uh, emerged as well. Um, and just to prove that she is a radical underachiever, um, she also has a uh, new uh, short story collection, Ball, uh, that's scheduled for publication, um, actually, uh, maybe already out, I think, in November. So it's scheduled in November. Um, so if we could ever get any work out of this woman, it would be good. Um, anyway, so uh, I told you I'd keep it short, uh, Tara. Um, Tara Eisen, please. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Congratulations to all of you. It's really wonderful to be here um, and celebrate your accomplishments. I, so many of you I've worked with, a lot of familiar faces. Um, and I really think it takes an extra kind of commitment and courage to have chosen to focus on the humanities these days, um, as you have, to choose to study the English language, uh, linguistics, rhetoric and composition, uh, film and media, creative writing. The writer Juno Diaz uh, came to the United States from the Dominican Republic when he was a young child. And he really struggled once he was here to make sense of who he was in the world. And a few years ago, he was talking to some students about vampires. And he said, quote, there's this idea that vampires don't have reflections in a mirror. And what I've always thought isn't that monsters don't have reflections in a mirror. It's that if you want to make a human being into a monster, deny them at the cultural level any reflection of themselves. A couple years ago, I went to see a lecture by the poet Dana Joya when he was chairman for the National Endowment for the Arts. And he was talking about the importance of arts funding in public schools, how things like music, theater, dance, uh, these things were not a luxury. Um, and he discussed how literature especially, uniquely, allows us to intimately enter the consciousness of another person, to get into their heart and soul and mind, to begin to understand their experience of the world. And in doing so, it creates our ability to feel empathy. And that is essential to the development of a full human being. Um, it's probably um, essential to our survival as, uh, as human beings, to the survival of humanity. And that made a huge impression on me. I was a young writer. I was a young teacher. And I, I felt that his version of the humanities and it's the reason we need it to represent, communicate, honor, reflect back and reflect upon our wildly diverse yet shared human experience was very, very inspiring to me. Um, I hope that is something also that you're taking away with you from your time in the humanities at ASU. So um, I am going to read from the new book that uh, Mark mentioned. It's called Reeling Through Life, How, to, How I Learned to Live, Love, and Die at the Movies. Um, and it's part film criticism, it's part memoir, but it's really about how film shapes identity and looking at all of the life lessons I learned from the movies, uh, from a lifetime of watching movies. So I'm going to read from the final essay in the book. Um, it's an excerpt from the essay that's called How to Be a Writer, The Beach House, The Bathrobe, and Saving the World. I am, in my beginning, a plagiarist. As a kid, I was effortlessly good at a little bit of a lot of things, which was fine but complicated by having benevolently over-enthusiastic parents. Twirl a bit and you can be a ballerina. Swim a few laps without gulping water into your lungs. Aim for the Olympics. 
One day when I was around six or seven and feeling a little restless and probably terrified by all of my looming potential, my mother suggested I go write something, a little poem, a story, a song. I liked the sound of that. I retreated behind my closed door armed with pencil and paper to go write something, to go be a writer. I sat on my bed and waited for the easy arabesque, the smooth glide through waves. Nothing came except for panic, a fear of failure, an acute new awareness of my empty mind, my lack of any appreciable talent. This wasn't easy, and I didn't know how long a writer should take before coming out of her room with a whole poem, an epic story, an entire song. But I couldn't come out without having become a writer, without having written something, or here was a way out, without having something written. I pulled from my shelf a book of poems for children, took it into my closet, crouched on the ground next to my Mary Janes, and copied out, word for word, a poem I found there about a little girl and an apple tree. A couple of quatrains, most likely an apple-dapple type of rhyme scheme. I presented it with a nervous, a nervous flourish to my mother. The proclamation, you wrote this? You'll be such a wonderful writer someday. Well, you're already a writer, how wonderful. And this is an abrupt joy to me, being called a writer. Suddenly the coolest, most crucial thing in the world to be. It obliterates the pastel ballerina in my mind, scoffs at the image of a gold medal dangling around my neck. I don't know why this identity, this label, thrills me so, but it does. And it was so easy. But how does a writer actually write anything, I wonder? I can see the product of writers everywhere, the thing the writer has created, the beloved books on my shelf I am so lucky to have. And I love the feel and smell of them, the pussy willow corner tips of worn hardbacks, the dusty flip of paperback pages, all those stories that move and enthrall and mesmerize me. But how does a writer do it? which reminds me, of course, that it is a lie, my being a writer. It's my first dirty little secret, my first fraud, that book of children's poems buried deep beneath the shoes in my closet and the sickening twist in my stomach when I think of that. And I know I better find out somehow how to be a real writer before the world is on to me. The first writer I ever saw was in a movie called Julia in 1977 when I was 13. I was still supposed to be a writer, but aside from that one purloined poem, I never actually wrote anything. I was waiting for the writing to just magically, effortlessly appear. Then, Julia. Opening credits, then a lovely twilight shot of a beach house lit from within, and the sound of typing, the old-fashioned clack, clack, clack of keys. And sure enough, we enter the beach house to find it's 1934, and playwright Lillian Hellman is clacking away on a manual, on a manual typewriter in a pink chenille robe, her hair rumpled, forehead attractively creased in thought, the toughening touches of a cigarette dangling at her lip, and a tumbler of whiskey nearby. I have no idea who Lillian Hellman actually is, but here is a writer, that much is clear, and I want that pink chenille bathrobe. Lillian stops punching at the keys and peers at the page. She doesn't like what she sees, rips the sheet from the typewriter's grip, throws it in a trash can full of crumpled pages, and goes to the window. Outside, a handsome man is heading up from the ocean's edge with a bucket of clams. The first line of dialogue I remember so clearly, Lillian, it's not working again, Dash. It's falling apart again. Hearing Lillian moan about this is comforting to me. So it wasn't just me and my stupid, empty mind. Writing is work. It's something you have to build and then watch fall apart, a sandcastle perched precariously close to the sea. But she's a real writer, so surely there are tricks to get you by, secrets to be learned. Maybe it's just the effort of that manual typewriter that's necessary, clack, 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 and then the rest is graceful ease. I begin taking notes. Dash, himself the real writer, Dashiell Hammett, though I have no clue who he is either, tells her, well, if you, can't re if you really can't write, Lily, maybe you should go find a job. Be a waitress. What about a fireman, huh? Lillian, I'm in trouble with my damned play and you don't care. I can't write here. 
dash. So don't write here. Don't write any place. It's not as if you've ever written anything before, you know. Nobody will miss you. It's the perfect time to change jobs. <laughs> oh, OK, I tell myself. No wonder she's struggling. She isn't a real writer, not quite yet. Lillian, you're the one who talked me into being a writer, Dashiell. You're the one who said, stick with it, kid. You got talent, kid. Now look at me. Dash, if you're going to cry about it, Lily, go stand on a rock. Don't do it around me. If you can't write here, go someplace else. Or give it up. Work in a drugstore. Be a coal miner. Only just don't cry about it. We retreat to Lillian's memories of her childhood friend, Julia, brilliant, idealistic, wholly committed to social justice, and willing to fling herself into a crowd of marauding fascist thugs. I don't understand most of Julia's politics or philosophies, but she's gorgeous, inspiring, intoxicating. Work hard, take chances, be very bold, she calls back to Lillian as she leaves for Vienna. Julia urges Lillian to get involved with people who are really doing something to change the world. Then Lillian will know what to write about. And I make an italicized mental note of this. I will, Julia. I will change the world. I will take up my mighty pen and do battle as soon as this movie is over. <laughs> Lillian holds up in a charmingly crummy Paris hotel for a seven-second montage of intense typing among plates of bread and cheese and fruit and half-drunk glasses of red wine. By now, I'm looking hungrily for such images, taking notes on the working hard, the taking chances, the being very bold. It all looks marvelous. Lillian is wearing a great white linen blouse, and I love bread and cheese and fruit, and I'm sure I'll love red wine someday. But how do you get from cheese and bread and seven seconds of typing to saving the world? Lillian sees oppressed workers marching outside her window and retreats, frightened. She's no Julia. Julia's the one doing something. Julia's been fighting those thugs on her mission to stop Mussolini and Hitler, and Lillian decided it's time to just go on home. Cut to success, acclaim, opening night of Lillian's play on Broadway, where she's overwhelmed by bravas and applause. She tells Dash she likes being famous and fantasizes about what to do with all the royalties pouring in, a sable coat, or should she give it all to charity? And Dash reminds her, it's only fame, Lily. It's just a paint job. If you want a sable coat, go buy one. But just remember, it doesn't have anything to do with writing. It's only a sable coat, and it doesn't have anything to do with writing. Who cares? She goes off to Europe, bejeweled and lipsticked, wearing her sable coat and hanging out with Hemingway. And I was right. Being a writer is the coolest thing in the world to be. But a friend of Julia's mysteriously appears with a request from Julia that Lillian carry money into Nazi Germany for them. They need cash to smuggle out Jews and political prisoners. Even I feel the sudden shame of that sable coat. Lillian feels obligated and guilty, and I don't blame her. One play, and it was so easy. She wrote it in seven seconds. And now look at all that jewelry. Doesn't she owe the world more than that? Work hard. Take chances. Be very bold. What a failure she is, I think. What a fraud. How will she ever face Julia again? But Lillian agrees to do it. She gets on a train to Berlin wearing thousands of dollars stashed in a fetching hat. Crossing into Germany, Lillian is questioned by an Aryan-looking border guard who raises an eyebrow at the Jewish-sounding Hellmann and asks, what is your occupation? Lillian, I'm a writer. Border guard, a writer? Lillian, yes. Border guard, so menacing pause. You would write of Berlin, Lillian. Oh, no, I wouldn't. Border guard, perhaps your impressions you would write. Lillian, my impressions? Yes, I would write my impressions. For heaven's sake, she's just a playwright, I think. What's all the fuss? I'm surprised and confused that this is what's being questioned, rather than her possible Jewishness. I don't understand. It's the money hidden in the hat that's dangerous, isn't it? Why does her being a writer disconcert this guy? Who cares if she writes about what's going on in Berlin? What in the world is so threatening about that, so powerful? 
And this is the end of the writing, anyway. Lillian makes it safely to Berlin and delivers the money to a grateful Julia. It is their farewell scene. Julia is murdered soon after. And Lillian spends the rest of the movie in despair at the loss of her beloved muse and mentor. But Lillian got to have it all, do it all. The beach house, the bathrobe and the sable coat, the bucket of clams, and saving a little bit of the world, too. I'm 13. I'm even more profoundly, delusionally in love with these images of the writer, with Paris, with the bread and cheese and wine and fabulous clothes, with walks on the beach and the sound of that typewriter, with being loved and feted by brilliant friends and handsome men, with the identity, with the label. This is what I decide I like, the paint job. This is what I decide I will aim for someday. I'm going to jump ahead in the essay about 15 years and 15 pages. Alcatraz Island had always intrigued me. Al Capone and the Birdman, the fog, the mythic, iconic rock. I'd seen the movie Escape from Alcatraz three times. In 1992, I took my first tour of the island and learned how the families of the prison staff actually lived there, the wives and children, down the road from the prison in an Aussie and Harriet kind of family compound in the 1940s and 50s. I thought about being a woman or a young girl in this most masculine and foreboding place in the entire country, and I was intrigued. A mother and daughter living on Alcatraz. How did that feel? What might their lives have been like? I start thinking about this imaginary mother and daughter living in another era and environment I know nothing about, and I begin to research it out of idle curiosity, I think. This mother and daughter start speaking to me, and I listen to their stories. Sorry. They're having a hard time. I start to worry about them. I try to give them advice to guide them, but they make their own decisions. I try to leave them to live their own lives, but they fill my mind. They are under my skin. They are in my heart. They won't leave me alone. They're struggling, they tell me, and no one will listen. They need me to tell their story because they cannot, and I'm terrified for them that their lives are in my hands. I can't possibly give them voice. This goes on for four years. One morning, I sit down at my desk. One sentence, I tell myself. That's all you have to write, one sentence. After that, you can go clean the bathroom, take the dog for a walk, go to the grocery store, go to a movie. I write my one dreadful, clumsy, pointless sentence and stop. Where's the applause? Where's Paris? Where's my hat with the money stashed inside? How am I saving Jews and political prisoners and the entire world with this one pathetic sentence? I hear Dash say, it's not as if you've written anything before, you know. Quit. Give it up. Nobody will miss you. And he's right, I think. I know he's right. What do I have to say? But then I think of this imaginary mother and daughter trapped in their lives, trapped in my head. The world will miss them. I'm sure of that. Work hard, take chances, be very bold, I hear Julia say. And I'm suddenly a six-year-old child again, crouched, hiding on the floor of my closet and expecting ease, hoping for the work to get done by magic, by montage, wishing for a children's book I can steal an apple-dapple poem from. I write a second sentence, and then a third, and then I lose count. And in the moment of writing, I'm not thinking about saving the world, or about applause, or the sable coat, or the beach house, or the paint job. I'm not thinking about myself, because it isn't about me. And in the moment of writing, it doesn't even matter if these sentences are even any good, because I'm just a writer. And for the first time, I've begun the writer's work. For the first time, I'm doing my job, which is to keep the faith and to write. I hope Julia would approve. Thank you, everybody, and congratulations again.